Greetings. Welcome to Worship with St. John United Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Anna Riki, and it is a joy to be gathered with you this day, whatever day it is. You are invited to bring yourself into whatever space is a sanctuary for you. You don't need anything in particular for worship, just yourself, the screen you're looking at, and if you want, anything you might like to add to your space, like your own hymnal or a candle or a cross. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. May God meet you just as you are. whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace, our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. Abiding God, you have been with us ever present through all of our days. Be with us now here as storms rage in our hearts and on our streets and throughout our lives. Reach out your hand, make yourself known, calm the storms of our lives that we might follow you more nearly and trust you more deeply. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 to 18. At Horeb, the mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mahola as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave seven thousand in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Here ends the reading. The psalm for today is Psalm 85 verses 8 through 13. It will be read responsively. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you, that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from the heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity. Our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord and shall prepare for God a pathway. Second reading, Romans 10, 5 to 15. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or, who will ascend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so I justified. And one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him 
will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear about someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the Holy Gospel according to the 13th chapter of Matthew, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart! It is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Holy God, bless my preaching and our hearing, that your word might bring us into deeper, activated relationship with you in this world. Amen. It is a joy to bring this word to you this morning. I want to start by acknowledging the first place my mind goes to when I hear this passage. And I wonder if it's the same for you, probably based on interpretations I've heard and maybe you have also. When Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus then says, O you of little faith, why do you doubt? These are the verses that rise to the surface right away. They are perhaps the most preached on and probably some wonderful sermons. Honestly, it's an easy place to go. Maybe not easy, but it's what we do. We go to the part that feels like a critique. Peter's doubt causes him to sink. In other words, as many messages have said, keep the faith lest you sink. But you know what? I am tired of that reading. I'm tired of hearing that the right way is to simply keep the faith. 
that those who lack the faith are the ones who will fall. As if we don't fall simply as part of life. I'm also tired of hearing the assumptions that follow, the pat responses we often hear from public faith leaders in the public sphere. I just have faith if we just have faith over this, over that, over that. It's too exclusive, far too simple. I do not connect with a God who simply constantly says, keep the faith. By the way, Jesus doesn't say that. That's what people say. As if keeping the faith is an assent to a modern set of ideals that require life's complexities and struggles to be eroded simply into troubles that could have been avoided if we just believed. Believed in what? In whom? We don't always know the answer to those questions. This passage, for me, is far more interesting in what it communicates about who God is, about who we are, about how God is active among us, rather than a trite tale about the importance of turning on faith like a light switch. In fact, this passage contains powerful revelation about God. One of Jesus' less obvious I am statements. We usually attribute the I am statements to the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the vine. I am the shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Matthew doesn't really do that. In fact, some folks would say Matthew doesn't use I am statements, but I'm here to disagree. If there's a statement in Matthew, for example, that's easy to write on a sign and held at a basketball game, like I am the way, the truth, and the life, it's a little more hidden in translation, but it's there. So Jesus says to Peter and the others on the boat, as they are terrified and think they've seen a ghost, they do not recognize Jesus. And he says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Actually, that it is I phrase is the phrase I am. In other words, take heart, I am, be not afraid. Let's put that on a sign with I am in big, bold letters. Rather than calls to have faith in a God we don't always recognize, sometimes we simply need to declare and hear that God is. Yes, yes, good, good, Pastor Anna, but holding up a sign that says, I am, might not work, right? Probably needs a little context. Let's see if the context of the verses from Matthew that we have connect at all with any experience we have today. John the Baptist has just been killed senselessly. And that news is out. Ordered killed by Herod Antipas because his stepdaughter requests it, saying more about the kind of petty violence that gets enacted by the state. Then about John the Baptist, a man of God, who called many to repentance. Now crowds have gathered around Jesus and the disciples, probably fueled simultaneously by their grief and anger over John's killing, by their hunger and their years of oppression by that same state. And Jesus responds first by enlisting these closest disciples to lend a hand and 
get some feeding going. Let's get to the basics, fill bellies and hearts with hope and nourishment. It is a beautiful moment, I imagine, for people who had been divided by the violence of the state, which can tend to cause us to isolate and care only for self-preservation, they have been fed. But now that this moment has passed, perhaps feeling stronger now that their bellies are full and their hope sparked, their anger and their grief is not gone. And here is where our passage begins. With Jesus very forcefully making his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him. He sends them away so that he can dismiss the crowd and go off to pray. Why would he send them away? Shouldn't he... Tell them to march on with their anger and head straight to the powers that be and tell them what's up. I imagine that Jesus, with all of these people, has a feeling they are not quite ready to face the power of the Roman state without getting crushed by it. And then these disciples who are Fired up for God. I mean, Jesus nicknames James and John the sons of thunder. But it seems that's not the gift he's looking to activate in this moment. He feels the people on the edge of perhaps boiling over with anger and guilt and he knows they cannot fight the violence of the state with violence in return because they will not win. It's time to disperse for now and chart a new way that begins with Jesus alone in prayer and the disciples rowing the boat. This past week, I attended a uh, training on militant nonviolent civil disobedience. And I learned the two most important rules of this approach, preservation of life and live to fight another day. Jesus has read the moment and knows they need some preparation. And it is in this context in which the disciples find themselves on the sea. From what I've heard from those who have visited the Holy Land, storms can appear on the Sea of Galilee in an instant. Sudden, massive windstorms that are a very real and present threat to life, much like the violence of the state can be. And a storm like this has come upon the sea with the disciples in their boat. And I imagine it is disorienting, exhausting, overwhelming, terrifying. Sometimes the world can be so brutal that all we crave is simply to find a way to transcend it all. If we even have a moment to be in touch with what we want. Perhaps we just feel, stop the boat, I want to get off. And then, as they're being battered by the waves, fighting for their lives, Jesus walks to them over the waters. It is beyond their imaginations. They think he is a phantom. This Jesus who walks through the storm to their embattled boat. Walking through their fear, not calling them to be more faithful, but simply present when he issues 
this. Take heart, I am, be not afraid. Our God, who is more powerful than the most powerful winds, who transcends the violent storms and finds their beloveds, simply is present. Imagine for a moment a world in which chaos and violence are so ever-present that the best news is simply that God, too, is ever-present and able to transcend the storms. And that maybe, just maybe, we too can transcend the storms. And Peter, yes, Peter wants this so much that, this is funny, the language that's used, he demands that Jesus commands him to leave the relative safety of the boat for a still violent sea. He wants to walk on the stormy waters. He wants Jesus to command him to come. Now that is faith, yearning to be called into the tumult. And Peter walks on water to Jesus. <sighs> yeah, he gets afraid and he starts to sink. Who wouldn't? But then Jesus reaches out with the power of the Most High, grabs Peter, rescues him from sinking while the waves rage on. And he says, you of little faith, why do you waver? The direct translation of that word waver is literally to stand in two ways. Jesus is like, you had it, Peter. You know it, my way. Yeah, Peter wavers. But that is far from the fullness of the story. Peter also walks on water, if just for a few steps. To focus only on his doubt or his wavering is to miss the great power of God amidst the tumult, calming the storms when we are most afraid and reaching out to rescue us when we fall. The crowds are just starting to wake up. Peter is just a baby disciple. But God remains the great I am, known too in this person of Jesus calling us to feed one another, to pray frequently, to continue to row the boat, to keep an eye out for Jesus, and to boldly step out of the boat into the tumult from time to time. O oh, ye of little faith, you too can walk on water if God but calls you. Amen.
called into relationship with one another and the whole creation, let us come together in prayer. For your whole church throughout the world, we pray. Give courage in the midst of storms so that we see and hear Jesus calling, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. May we follow Christ wherever we are led. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the well-being of your creation, we pray. Protect waterways, forests, lands, and wildlife from exploitation. Help the human family endeavor to sustain and be sustained by the resources you have entrusted to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the world facing coronavirus, we pray. Sustain nurses, doctors, chaplains, and all hospital staff. Assist our Congress and governors in legislating wisely during the pandemic. Give wisdom to educators as they plan the fall semester. Give us kindness with one another and patience for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our prayer. For those in need, we pray. For those who are homeless, hungry, or hospitalized. For those facing cut employment benefits. For those who are fearful of the future. And for those we name before you now. Adam, Addie, Amy, Al, Alex, Amy, Bill, Bonnie, Charlene, Dan, Dana, Debbie, Dick, Greg, Jamie, Jason, Jennifer and family, Jerry, John, Kate, Chris, Lisa, Marilyn, Marvin, Richard, Tim. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayer. prayer. For the end to racial justice, racial injustice, we pray. Heal all prejudices between peoples that are based on ethnic origin or skin color. Show us how to repent and provide reparations. Unite us so that we may celebrate differences within one human family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you, O God, for all who have died in the faith, for martyrs, for leaders in the struggle for civil rights, for victims of COVID-19, for those dear to us. Bring us at the end with all your saints into your everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our congregation of St. John United, we pray. You hold us together while we cannot gather in person, and we thank you for this gift. As we look toward the fall, may we continue to find new ways to foster connections and community. Supply us generously with your grace for our life together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray together. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts, that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Greetings, siblings in Christ. I have a few announcements for you. Uh, the first is a note about worship. In the fall, your leadership has really done a lot of discernment and is carefully paying attention to the climate and has decided we will continue with online worship through at least October. And in the meantime, we're going to do uh, what we can to make worship an even more engaging experience as we are in disparate places. So um, I'm going to ask those of you who are able, who receive our weekly email, and if you don't, you can email our church office about that. If you receive our weekly email, pay attention to a little poll where we ask about when you would prefer to have a Sunday Zoom fellowship slash education hour. It's our guess that we don't want to spend time on Zoom both before and after worship like we would have when we were in person in the building. So we are wanting your feedback on whether we should have that regular hour before worship, starting at around 9.15, or after worship, starting at about 11.45. So if you could just take a moment to fill out that poll, that would be very helpful to us. And stay tuned to uh, hear about other ways that we're going to increase engagement for worship, like premiering our video live, but it'll still be available for you to view later if you like. And of course, we really would love your participation in all of this. So if you're willing to be a co-host for a Zoom hour, for example, we'd love to hear that and would be happy to offer training. Uh, and also more details about this in the weekly email. We uh are sending a group of folks from the church to an anti-racism workshop. And the more the merrier. So if you're interested in something like that, just register yourself or contact me. There is a cost, but we have ways to help pay for that if that is a barrier. So it'll be a three-week intensive course that meets on Sunday afternoons and Monday evenings for a short while. So you are most warmly welcomed to join in that endeavor. And finally, as always, you continue, continue to show up in so many ways by giving your time, your talent, your energy, and your money. And thank you so much for doing that. You are keeping us going in these difficult times. Uh, you can give the way you have been by mailing a check to the church office or going to the giving page on our website. There's a little red donate button on the home page and you click that and you can do a one-time gift or set up a really simple account to do a reoccurring gift if you'd like and we just so appreciate your doing that so thank you thank you for working with us to stay engaged and find creative ways to be the gathered yet disparate church in these days the peace of christ be with you all and also with you. Thank you. 
death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you now and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. Thank you.